I'm going to be pulling out uh, some things from the book, which um, you can buy, of course, um, uh, which, and, and giving you a flavor of it. It will really be snatches rather than a comprehensive survey. It's a, it's a book which is uh, full of new documentation and I hope of uh, fresh ideas as well. Um, the, the book is called, as you can see, the people and the painting, and the intention behind it is to scrape away all the myths, all this great aggregation of, uh, of nonsense, of supposition, that it ceased to become something of which real people did in real time, in real space, in real places. And what we aim to do, particularly in the first half of the book, which is about the documentation of the people involved, is to get them back to being normal people, including Leonardo, rather than just this legendary figure who becomes incredible, and all the other participants, Lisa becomes some kind of legendary thing. So we aim to get a real sense of the grit of reality behind that, and to get it back to being basically a, a, norm, a normal commission. Uh, the my partner in crime in this was Giuseppe Palanti, an extraordinary man. He's not an art historian, he's not indeed a historian. He's an economist who lectured in the School of Tourism in Florence, but his passion is for archives. Academics now, it's not very good working in archives. It's slow, you don't necessarily get results, and you don't guarantee good research reviews. Um, so you need these private people um, who spend more or less all his free time. Uh, I've met his family, who are extremely delightful, and they seem to be very supportive of this. Um, all his free time excavating the archives in a rather uncritical way, just looking for documents which relate to the participants in the story which, um, which, I, which I will be telling. Anyway, thank you, Giuseppe. It's a um, uh, very, very modest man um, and an absolute pleasure, pleasure to work with. Um, the, this, the, the, the various sections here anyway, this is Francesco and Lisa, Francesco del Giacondo, um, who emerges as quite a character, and Lisa Garadini. The Garadini were old landed gentry, rather decayed, and certainly uh, Lisa's part of the family was distinctly decayed. Um, the father with a name but really no, no money. They lived in the Via Squazza, which is, you can see there, which is on the, uh, on the south side of the Arno, not the most propitious area. It would have been a rather insanitary place. It was uh, a rented property. And uh, Anton Maria, uh, Lisa's father, was always, he had a name but was a kind of, the sort of aristocrat one knows who has more sense of bearing and name than actual substance to justify, um, justify their claims to uh, superiority. Um, this is the, the birth certificate of, um, or the, the birth record of, uh, of, of Lisa, Lisa Garadini who was um, born in 14, uh, born in June, 15th of June, 1474, uh, 1479. Um, and her birth as Lisa Camilla is duly recorded there. I think five, four or five lines down, but you can, you can probably pick it up. It's near the, near the top of that list. Um, we've looked a lot at Leonardo's handwriting, but handwriting at this time is very different. The italic script came in about this time, but most of the documents we're dealing with are very, very difficult to read. So we find Leonardo's handwriting too easy, to, difficult to read, but this is not that simple either, is it? Um, uh, you need some skills in pale paleography of, uh, of the, how the letters are formed and so on, which uh, Giuseppe richly has. Um, she married Lisa Garadini, the um, married uh, Francesco de Giacondo in 1495, when she was 15. Um, the general age for marriage was almost as soon, for women, was almost as soon as puberty had set in. And they were married typically between 13 and 16, almost always arranged marriages, um, both in lower levels of society and higher levels of society. 
um, and it is, there's an appalling attrition of young brides uh, giving birth very early, of stillbirths and of brides dying young. And the husbands tended to marry when they were about 26, 27, 28, and they were probably, very typically, they'd have two, three, four wives marrying these young wives who produced babies as they were meant to do, but they were, in a sense, almost sort of disposable. Um, it's really a rather an unhappy situation. Uh, the man she married, Francesco del Giocondo, is described as a silk merchant, and indeed he was a silk merchant. Um, silk was the number two industry in Florence after wool. But he was more than that. He's, he's emerged from the documents as a real operator. Um, he lent money at rather extravagant rates, including to his uh, Lisa's, Lisa's father. And Lisa's father couldn't pay it back, and uh, it all became rather punitive and unpleasant. He would import anything that made money. He imported leather from Ireland, um, sugar from Madeira, and he opened a branch in Lyon. So this is a rising merchant who certainly trod on a lot of toes along the way. He wasn't Medici class, either socially or in terms of sheer wealth, but um, he made a, made a lot, of, lot of money. Um, the house you see there on the right of the, of the slide is the house which he occupied, which is a good deal, the number of steps up from the Via Squazza. Um, it backs onto the palace of the Tadei family, Michelangelo and Leon Raphael patrons, and Raphael was residing just over the road there when Leonardo was painting Elisa del Giocondo. It's a small place, Florence, and it's nice to get these kind of sense of the locality. And there's no way that Leonardo could have missed Raphael, which is just over the wall, and that's the garden of the Tadei <coughs> palace, so we can, we can get these senses of... Uh, of particular, particular kind of uh, c connections. Um, he made a lot of money, Francesco. He um, uh, was a very successful merchant. And to give an idea of the style in which he lived, he owned this villa, or a villa which has now been destroyed, but he owned a villa in this place, in Montughi, outside Florence, um, with two farms attached to it. And this is one of the this is prime location 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 as they say in the in the real estate business and uh, this gives an idea and we went up and saw that it's it's now a a, a, a home for children with learning dis difficulties and so on um, and very difficult to get into but that that's the view that Francesco will have had the Medici had villas up here this is he's he's not in that league but. Um, He's in the next rung down and is, was doing very, very well. Um, Lisa herself had a particular att uh, attraction, attachment to Saint Ursula, um, now a more or less derelict convent uh, quite close to where she lived. It's on the left. Um, and uh, she had placed two of her daughters there, one who died quite young and one lived an old age. And when she... Uh, when her husband died, she retired to St. Ursula. It was a convent to which she was much attracted. It's now being developed, I think, as a, as a tourist centre of some sort, or, or an arts and tourist centre. So it seems that it, it, will, it will be duly resurrected. Um, we've got records of her paying for one of her daughter's accommodation. This is an aristocratic convent. It was fashionable for... Uh, aristocratic young women to live rather good lives in selected convents and you could pay for better furniture and you could pay for uh, a cell which was not a cell in the normal sense of the word and you could also pay to avoid all, all the regular religious observances providing you took part in some of them so St Ursula is a kind of refuge for daughters for whom you did not want to pay their dowry um, Uh, Francesco himself uh, was a patron, um, not on a grand scale, but a pr pretty good patron. He had a chapel in Santissima Annunziata um, in the new nave, uh, quite a big chapel. You see the tomb marker there of the Del Giocondo family, and he commissioned an altarpiece from Domenico Puligo, um, a follower of Andrea del Sarto, who died very young. The St. Francis commissioned by Francesco doesn't survive, but his cousin commissioned this 
painting from Puligo, the vision of St. Bernard. Uh, and it gives an idea of the, uh, the, ki the, the picture that um, Francesco himself might, might have had. Um, the strange thing is that Lisa was not buried in the family vault. She's not buried in Santa Simona Nunziata, which is a, is a very prestigious vault, but she was buried in St. Ursula in the, in the convent where she was residing. That's odd. Uh, I've got no explanation for it, but it does suggest maybe that uh, her devotion to St. Ursula was more than her devotion to her husband in retrospect. Um, And Santa Simona Nunziata actually provides a, an important locus for the uh, figures to come together because uh, Leonardo's father was the procurator. He was a legal officer for uh, Santa Simona Nunziata, the Church of the Most Holy Annunciation. Francesco del Giocondo, the reason he got a, cha a chapel there is because he managed a lot of the land assets. Uh, monasteries, convents were landowners, they, they were really commercial centers in their own right, as well as being uh, sites of religious devotion. Um, and so Leonardo's father, Francesco del Giocondo, Leonardo in 1500, when he comes back to Florence, is given accommodation in Santissima Annunziata. So these people, we know they're, they're, they're in, in the same place at the same time. And it's very, as I say, it's very nice to get these connections because it kind of normalizes things. And you can think, well, you know, Francesco says, yeah, I'd really like a portrait out of, uh, out of Leonardo. Can you speak to your son? And, uh, and, uh, and Leonardo, Leonardo, there's a kind of a mutual obligations develop. Leonardo at this time had to paint the Battle of Anghiari. He had all sorts of other tasks in hand. Um, probably Francesco would, would have said, yeah, well, it's only a small portrait, you know, he can do it, do it in his spare time, as it were. Um, anyway, the, the family connections are absolutely clear, and they, they would have known each other on a, on a virtually da daily basis. Um, Leonardo's father has emerged, uh, Piero da Vinci, as a very considerable figure, uh, a leading figure. Um, he did notarial work for the Medici, for the Florentine government, and for Sant'Anato Ascopeto, which is the monastery for which Leonardo painted the, or didn't finish, the Adoration of the Magi. Leonardo is always known in Florence as Leonardo di Ser Piero da Vinci, um, so there's no sense that this illegitimate child was somehow disowned or not recognized as his, as, as his, father's, um, as his father's son. Um, anyway, to the um, uh, and this is um, where his office was. The Bargello on the right there was the Palazzo del Podesta. The Podesta was the chief legal officer, and this is where this is the high court, as it were. It's where all the major trials, legal events. Uh, Sir Piero's office was immediately opposite this. He had one or two offices, but latterly he had an office in the Via Ghibellina here. And if you came out of the door of the, Bar of the Bargello, now the Sculpture Museum, then the, site of the, the legal site in Florence, the immediate notary you would see over the road is Sir Piero da Vinci. Um, he couldn't have, been, uh, couldn't have been better placed than uh, uh, to, to get business. Um, we got into, we tracked his house. We found out which house he owned in the Via Ghibellina, slightly further down not far from Michelangelo's um, Casa Buonarroti, as it now is in Florence. And it's a rather gracious house. There are traces of a cortile. Um, it's not huge. And um, we found also the inventory of Sir Piero's possessions on his desk, on his death. And he had very fancy stuff. He had uh, painted furniture, furniture which was inlaid. He had a map of Mundi. He had an ostrich egg. If you look at the Medici's possessions, it's exactly the same kind of shape of possessions, albeit on a much, um, much lower economic scale. So he lived a very stylish life. He was a, obviously an educated, cultivated man. He had works of art of a devotional kind, I think probably none by Leonardo. Um, and he had a portrait of, uh, Le uh, of his brother um, who le with whom Leonardo had very close, um, close relationships. So we're getting the fabric of Sir Piero as a very um, considerable figure in his, 
in his own right, a, le a leading lawyer. And I suspect Leonardo's early commission for the, um, for the altarpiece in the council hall in Florence that the fact that he was the father of a major, he was the son of a major lawyer helped, as always um, connections and uh, family status are of importance in these particular things. Um, he was a great reproducer. Um, Leonardo is his first child, as you see there at the top of the list, and I won't go through this, but in his 70s, he's, he is still producing children. Um, the, the, the house must have been like a village school. There were children of virtually ev every age. Um, the, the, uh, a man who, of, um, of, of legal potency and uh, reproductive potency as well. Um, Santa Simone Annunciata, I've spoken about, so I'll skip through. I'll skip. Um, I'll, I will uh, skip through that. Um, along the way, when working with Giuseppe, I suggested that I didn't believe in a number of the myths around Vinci. I said I thought we should be able to find Caterina, his mother, who we know was married off to a local man relatively quickly after Leonardo's birth. It's 100 houses in Vinci, no more than that, so it should be able to find Caterina. I also said I don't believe in the Casa Natale, the so-called birthplace at, Vin at uh, Anchiano, which has been kitted out with multimedia displays, car parks, and so on. But uh, when I first saw it, it was, a, it was two peasants' houses. And there's no, there was no concrete evidence, so I set uh, Giuseppe on the trail, and like a, a dog looking for a buried bone, he came up with the, the goods in both respects. Um, Vinci is a small place. Um, I said about 100 houses. Um, there you're in the castle of the Conte Guidi, but this was ruled by Florence at this time, so the castle was the seat of Florentine governmental power. And Vinci consisted of of two, two units. There was the so-called castello, the walled bit. Um, the, the oval bit is called the castello. There are domestic houses in that area, not just the castello itself. And then down the hill coming southerly, there's an area they called the Borgo, which was the village. And there's a loggia, which is the loggia del comune, um, an open lodger, but probably with a government uh, a, a council on top, a pozzo, or a poxo, as it says there, a, a, a well. Um, a very small place. The, and we, uh, Giuseppe looked at all, the ownership of all these properties in this area and found the ones that were owned by Francesco, the brother, the brother of Sir Piero, by Sir Piero, and by the father. So we've got the Vinci houses sorted out um, and there they are in Via Roma, uh, greatly altered. There's none of, the, none of the Vinci fabric there, but they're, they're on, on the right of the, uh, of the road as it comes down, the, the more, slightly more heavily shaded ones on that 16th century map. Um, we, know, we knew already when Leonardo was born from a mem memorandum by Antonio, Sir Piero's father, his, Leonardo's grandfather, and he wrote in a... Um, you know, book of uh, memoriae, which he rarely, very rarely entered anything into, but on in this occasion he enters the story of the birth. My grandson was born, son of Sir Piero, my son, and on the 15th of April, at the hour of three o'clock in the night, he was named Leonardo, baptised by the priest Piero di Bartolomeo da Vinci. And then there follows a list of the, grand, the godparents who are leading citizens in Vinci. So it's a public baptism on a Saturday, a good list of godparents, and Leonardo is absolutely not an illegitimate, unwanted child. Illegitimate children, indeed children as slaves, were often brought up within the family, so we don't have that stigma. Leonardo was legally excluded from becoming a notary, but uh, uh, otherwise there is, there is no particular stigma. Almost all the aristocratic families had illegitimate kids on their books um, for in, of one sort or another. Um, five years later, 28th of February 50, 1457, Leonardo is listed as a bocca in his uh, grandfather's tax return. A bocca means a mouth, and in the tax, Florentine tax returns, children and dependents are listed as mouths. I suspect those of us who have had children will rather sympathise with this description. <laughs> 
Um, and anyway, Leonardo was a, a Bacca. We also learn in the same uh, document that Caterina, the mother, was then the wife of a man called Antonio Butti, who was also known as Acata Briga, which means he had a rather quarrelsome temperament. Um, he, was a, he was a farmer. He indulged in various bits of things to keep the wolf from the door, but wasn't a rich person. But he must have received the dowry from the family. There's no way even somebody like Antonio Butti was going to marry uh, a, a, a mother with an illegitimate son somewhere else. So the Vinci family must have paid not very much money for a dowry for... Um, uh, a dowry for Caterina to lubricate the marriage to, uh, to Antonio. But who is this Caterina? There's been a lot of speculation and so on, but I'm pretty confident we've got the document which um, says who she is. This is the posthumous catasto tax return of uh, Giovanna Lippi, um, recording her possessions at her death and you've got a, a list of various things. But right at the bottom, the, the, the second line from the bottom, you've got Caterina, who is aged 15. Uh, age 14, sorry. Oh, no, age 15, sorry. Um, Caterina, age 15. And Papo, um, who is her brother, who is age two. Um, Caterina is Caterina di Meo Lippi, which is short for Bartolomeo. But Mayo Lippi was a, seen to be in a no good. He disappeared. Um, he's recorded and then evaporates. Maybe he dies, but he's not around. We don't know who the mother or mothers are. So you've got this situation of a 15-year-old girl living with her grandparents in Vinci, um, very vulnerable, um, with a, a young son to look after, really the, the absolute bottom of the economic pile. Um, Giuseppe found in the time when... Uh, Leonardo must have been conceived. Uh, Sir Piero wasn't conducting any legal business in Florence at all. He was back in Vinci. And I suspect a summer evening, um, young people, Leonardo's father slightly older, um, and uh, the woman very vulnerable. But she must have known, or it was roughly apparent, that she was never going to be a wife for somebody who was the son of a notaries and landowners. Um, so it is something of a sob story in that case. She was married off. She produced children herself for, for Antonio. And there's a rather interesting um, postscript to this, that there's a record in one of the Forster codices in the V&A. He says, Caterina came to stay. This is 1494. Her husband was dead. Caterina's husband was dead. Could that be the mother? Um, it didn't seem, you know, Katerina's a common name, so I thought, well, this probably doesn't w really work. But the, we then find that Leonardo paid the funeral expenses of Katerina. So you think, oh, you know, this is somewhat unusual. And in the Libro dei Morti in Milan, the death at that time of Katerina da Firenze was recorded. And Leonardo was Leonardo da Firenze in Milan. So I think if you want to a happy or poignant end to this story, uh, which is reasonably definite but not absolutely certain, then you can envisage Caterina in her late 60s coming to Milan and spending under a year but uh, a rather remarkable time with her famous, famous son. So this rather melancholy story of uh, somebody at the bottom of the economic pile being impregnated by this uh, young lawyer, um, there is a, a, a poignant end to this, uh, this particular tale. Um, where does this lead? Oh, and uh, this is, these are the houses in which um, Antonio and Caterina lived. They look rather smart now. They've been bijoufied, if there is such a word, um, made into attractive <coughs> homes. But there would have been a number of families in this home, and the, the stairs are what in Scotland we would call a four stair. That's to say they go up to a separate living area, and it may well be the lower gra the ground floor was full of agricultural equipment and so on. So, and probably about five or six families would uh, live in what would have been pretty broken down properties. So she, she lived a, a life which was livable, but uh, not much um, probably beyond, beyond that. Um, where does this leave the Casa Natale? Um, it leaves it, as the Giuseppe found out, as a series of peasants' houses in it wasn't at this property, wasn't owned by the Vinci family at this time. It contained two vedove, two widows, and it contained two peasants. 
and the buildings are recorded as pretty derelict. Um, the legend of the Anchiano, this property of Anchiano, as being the Casa Natale, the birthplace, grew over the years, but it's totally without foundation, um, uh, which is difficult. Uh, as Vinci have invested a lot of money in this, we had a Skype with Vinci authorities saying, look, we should tell you there's some not very good news for you coming along the way. And they said, oh, would you come out and do a book launch? Um, so Giuseppe and I went out to uh, went out to Vinci and um, and did a book launch in the with the local uh, cultural assessor there, the mayor, and uh, various other people in the Bibliotheca Vin uh, Leonardiana in Vinci. Enormously well attended. Incidentally, sitting in the front row is Carlo Pedretti, um, very frail but uh, a great Leonardo scholar who you who's been mentioned uh, many times in this. Anyway, uh, we played down the Casa Natale controversy. We said, well, it's a kind of Casa Natale spirituale. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's fine. Has anybody been to Anchiano and, and done, the, done that little bit? Yeah, the rest of you need to go now. Um, uh, but and we thought the mother, Caterina, was going to be uncontroversial, but a local... A uh, winemaker, landowner, the man who set up the now closed Museo Ediali in Vinci, Alessandro Vezzosi, is committed to the idea that Leonardo's mother was a slave, um, without good evidence, but he started DNA testing and so on. And at the end, he came up, grabbed the microphone uh, at the lectern, took over the whole event, and spoke for a quarter of an hour and ended with effusive tears. It was the most remarkable thing. Um, the, the audience began to get involved, and there was applause, and there were comments from the audience, and it became, it became like a kind of soccer match, in a way. Um, but uh, th this is Italy. It does it's some remarkable things. But we thought the uncontroversial thing was having discovered the teenage mother, and it proved to be completely inflammatory. But... Uh, <laughs> With, with, with Italy, which I love, but you, you, ne you never know. Um, uh, these just, uh, we, we've got much more documentation and we tell the story of the lives of the people and what they did and so on, but that just gives you a flavour of, um, of what is, I think, a rather vivid picture of real people doing, doing actual things in, in actual time. Um, that's the people, the painting... Well, I su su suggested the painting comes about, or the commission comes about, the order comes about, because of the relationship between Francesco del Giocondo and, um, and Sir Piero da Vinci. Uh, in, Sir Piero actually conducted one of his legal arbitrations in the silk merchant's property near the Ponte Vecchio. Um, so we, c we can tie them in regularly, uh, that uh, they're absolutely... Uh, locked in as professional partners in, in, in this way. So they came about in a perfectly standard way. We now know, um, it, or I should explain what these are. On the right is what the Mona Lisa looks like now if you see it. On the left, this is a digital restoration by Pascal Cott, with whom I've collaborated, a genius of multispectral scanning. And this is based upon algorithms to take out dirty varnish, color correct, and, uh, and uh, cracks. It's not fiddle around with Photoshop, which a lot of us can do, but this gives us good an idea as we're going to get at this stage of uh, what Mona Lisa looked like. And it's very different, isn't it? The space suddenly comes out. It has this vivid living property, um, and I'm going to be using that, to, that during the course of, course of the rest of the talk. And we know by which time the painting was underway there was a man called um, Agostino Vespucci, from, not from the same family as uh, Mergo Vespucci. Agostino Vespucci was a humanist clerk in government service in Florence and a friend of Machiavelli and an acquaintance of Leonardo. Um, Agostino provided him with the Italian account of the Battle of Anghiari, which Leonardo was to paint. So Agostino Vespucci and Leonardo are, uh, are part of the related enterprises. And he owned a book, Cicero's Letters to Friends, uh, published, I think, in 1488. Um, and he and a number of other humanist colleagues annotated it. This is almost certainly by Agostino himself. They went through noting things in Cicero's letters. And Cicero was a, a great god of lit literary expression and, um, and probity for, for the Renaissance. 
And in the margin, he writes, and I translate, Apelles the painter, um, pedantically, Apelles having been spelt with two Ps, they cross out one of the Ps, saying that's not right. Apelles the painter, this is what Leonardo da Vinci does in all his paintings. What Apelles is described as doing is leaving parts of his picture unfinished. Um, in the letter, in the letters, that bit of the letters, uh, Apelles is described as leaving his pictures in cohartum, which is incomplete or incohate, and that he just finished the faces, and the rest he didn't, he didn't finish. So this is what Leonardo da Vinci does in all his paintings, as in the head of Lisa del Giocondo and Anne, the mother of Mary. We will see what he does in the Hall of the Great Council, about which he has made an agreement with the standard bearer, the Gonfalonieri, 1503 October. Um, testa here, or in, in the caput in Latin means head, equivalent of Italian testa. Now this is the term used in inventories, including uh, Sir Piero's inventories for portraits. So it doesn't literally mean to say that the head of Mona Lisa is finished and not the rest of it. This, this document is always misinterpreted in that sense. A testa or a caput is a portrait. Um, so it's unfinished, but it isn't the face that's unfinished, and it's certainly not just the head of St. Anne in the famous picture he was painting, which is, a, which is finished. Um, so it begins in a, in a fairly straightforward way. In 1503, it's being painted. Leonardo is meant to be doing the Battle of Anghiari. Uh, people have, or have doubts, well-founded well doubts, about whether Leonardo is going to finish any of these, and Agostino, as a friend, is certainly alert to that. Um, but what happens to it, I think, is very remarkable, and it fits with the technical examination. I think it ceases to become a portrait, and it becomes a picture in Leonardo's hands. It becomes a universal picture. It starts as a likeness, a functional likeness, of this woman, Lisa Garadini, who's of no great historical importance beyond Leonardo. And he gets obsessed with putting in everything he can put into a picture into this one. He kept it with him. Um, and it becomes a kind of pictorial manifesto. It says, this is what I can do. And Leonardo knew he was good. And he knew it was special and it, and it stayed with him. Let's see how we can uh, justify this claim, looking first of all at uh, what we may call anachronistically the science of the Mona Lisa, and secondly at the poetry of the Mona Lisa. And we've heard too little about poetry. We've heard Leonardo didn't think much of it, but that's not entirely true. Um, just picking out some of these scientific things. Optics, we've done some of this already, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But I'm, when we, in the first talk I gave, I said he was very concerned with the physical qualities of light, percussioni impact, and argued that the actual illumination, the ratio of light and shade on the human head was proportional to the angle of impact of the light. The direct blow, the right angle blow, strikes a, a very hard percussione. A 45 degree is half as strong, thir uh, 33 degrees is a third as strong, and so on. So it's minutely graded. Now, Leonardo's not going to do that for every head, but this is deeply informed, these very smooth transitions of precisely pitched light and shade to give relievo, to give relief. Underneath that is that notion of the proportionality of, uh, of light and shade according to, the, according to the angle of impact. Just probably press and go in the right direction, that always helps. And we saw also that uh, Leonardo in the Codex Lester, when he's explaining the Lumen Cenereum, the ashen light in the new moon, in the shaded part of the moon, uh, deduces this as reflections off the Earth's sea into the moon. And we also noted that he had a sense that the darker bits appearing against light bits would appear enhanced and the, the, that there would be a tonal contrast between light and shade, enhancing the boundary conditions in each case. And in terms of these rebounds, these percussioni, these secondary rebounds, which most artists didn't, didn't use, I'm just showing you there the neck of the Mona Lisa in Pascal's reconstruction and the, um, the hand of the Virgin in the London National Gallery of the Rocks. You can imagine almost a baseball player, a basketball player, bouncing the ball, and light behaves like that. It, it has this 
a physical particulate uh, quality to it. Um, Leonardo um, does show signs of espousing the atomic theory. He talks about atomy in, in light, um, which he came from Lucretius. So he has some sense that uh, light might well be a particulate uh, substance rather than some strange mysterial, mysterious e ether. Um, yeah, and I, I showed you in the other lecture that he takes this through to paintings, that the, the shoulders of St. Anne, uh, the shoulder of the Virgin, and the landscape, and so on. He's enhancing the boundary conditions, to, which gets really evil. It gets this vivid uh, sense of uh, one figure in front of another, one item in front of another. And then he blurs the landscape so that the sharpness of these edge contrasts is, is enhanced by the, the blur of the distant blue landscape. Um, amazing bits of optical observation. Look at the veil. It's a very, very thin translucent veil. Um, uh, a silk veil, almost certainly, may, may be silk taffeta. Um, Francesco, remember, was a silk merchant. Where it goes over the head, you've got the dark border, but the light of the skin shines through, so you can't really see the, the, the dusky nature of the veil. Once it passes over her hair and over the sky, it, it becomes uh, much grayer, it becomes uh, much more visible. And that's incredible. You know, you don't get that by thinking about it. You don't get that by doing conventional drapery. You've got to look very hard at how a veil like that behaves on human flesh and against the, against the background. Um, I, I, there are always things in Leonardo that I don't see originally, but then I pick them up. And they, there's a kind of awesome nature to it. It's inexhaustible. The harder you look, the more that picture gives back to you. And in terms of optics, um, early in his career, he's clear that the eye is a uh, geometrical instrument and works in a very straightforward way. He's dealing with what you might call the optics of certainty early in his career. By the time of the Mona Lisa, he's read in some shape or form the treatise by the Arab, by the uh, Persian uh, opti uh, uh, f uh, philosopher. One of the great texts on optics by Ibn al-Haytham, or al-Hazan, as he's known in the West. And al-Hazan talks about a very complicated optical system in the eye with a spherical crystalline humor, what we would now call the lens, and uh, tries to plot a very elaborate scheme whereby the image is put upright again. The image comes through the camera obscura of the eye, the pinhole camera. It expands and is inverted. And Leonardo tries to get the geometry of how this spherical crystalline humor might reinvert the image and then deposit it on the back of the optic nerve. It's not the retina, it's, uh, it's the back of the optic nerve. And he has to do this deductively. You, you can't get this by dissection. Incidentally, the eye of animals, certainly cats, if you dissect it out, the lens becomes spherical. So it's not a, the idea that the crystalline humor it's spherical, is is not a daft idea. Um, the, this drawing by Leonardo in the Cogit Atlantico, at the top you see him trying out these optical systems, and below, rather characteristically, he thinks, well, what about an experiment to see if we can do a camera obscura, a box, put a lens in, and will that actually deliver what I'm saying it will deliver? A prova, a test, as Leonardo would do it. But one of the consequences of all this elaborate optics, you don't have a focusing system since the crystalline lens isn't focusing, it's just performing refraction. And so he decides that seeing is a very slippery business. He says at one point, the eye does not know the edge of any body. At certain points, it will appear decently defined. Uh, as you get further away, less defined. As it comes closer, it will be blurred. So there's a kind of optimum viewing range, but it's quite a narrow range. It's like depth of focus in photography. Um, you can have a very narrow depth of focus depending upon how the camera is set up. And uh, so and what you then get is what I call the optics of uncertainty, uh, the optics of certainty in the Last Supper. The, the, the perspective is about optical certainty, about the geometry of optics. In Leonardo's later paintings, there's no perspective. It's all done by atmosphere, it's all done by tone, it's done by color, and it's done by blurring. And if you could zoom into the Mona Lisa's features, there are no lines. Even the edge of her head isn't a line. So the eye does not know the edge of any body. And in Leonardo's pictures, there are no edges. 
uh, by the time the Mona Lisa is, is being painted. There are in the earlier pictures. So he's, he realizes that vision is a very slippery, very qualified, very elusive thing. And this elusiveness is very much in, the, in, in Mona Lisa in how it's, uh, how it's created. And water, we can do this reasonably briskly as we saw it before. Leonardo's wonderful studies of turbulence in water. The drawing on the left there, the water coming out of a bocca, a square opening, um, which is one where you measured water in Milan if you were taking water off a canal and selling it on to uh, farmers. Leonardo was granted a water concession by the king. He didn't want the water, but he, he sold it on to the, the local farmers. Um, but it, it relates to these experimental tanks in the Codex Leicester, where you've got the tanks which he describes as being made with glass sides and a ceramic base, and a bocca, the square opening. In both these dry drawings here in the Codex Leicester, it's about wind. He's looking at what wind does to the waves. But of course, you can put water in there as well. And I suspect these uh, miraculous drawings at Windsor are based upon his experimental tank, his sperientia, as he, he calls it in the headline to that particular, that particular note. And we noted the parallel between the curling of water and the movement of hair, the weight of the hair, the direction of the current, and the tendency to revolve, giving the helix. And on the, on the left, the wig for Leda. This is a wig um, for Leda and the Swan, the great lost painting by Leonardo, the most tragic loss of all his, um, all his paintings. And the artificial designer of the wig uses the geometry of hair, the geometry of water. So it's a highly artificial, contrived version of, of natural hair. And as you can see, there's a, there's a hole in one, the middle of one of these worlds at the side, so some water or hair spout, spouts out in a rather licentious way, and there are little dribbles of hair from the, uh, from the side of her wig. Um, Leonardo then looks at the back of the wig. Raphael wouldn't have done that. Raphael would have thought that was a waste of time. But Leonardo needs to know how it works, even if it's not going in the picture. Um, there's a kind of integrity and ethics of uh, representation, which is desperately unpractical, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but deep, deeply admirable at the same time. Um, water in the body of the earth. Again, we've seen something of this, so I would go through it fairly quickly. At the time he's painting Mona Lisa, from 1503 onwards, he's experimenting not just with bypassing Pisa for military reasons with a canal, but with a civic scheme for a great civic uh, canal arching up through Prato and Pistoia. Now I pointed out that this is where the A11 is, and this, was, um, this is going along the A11 near Pistoia. So he got his levels absolutely right, as improbable as that great arching canal looks. The current motorway goes on more due west, and it doesn't curve down to rejoin the Arno, but we can see roughly how that works. Um, Leonardo even talks about how much it would cost, how many laborers you need, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not pipe dreaming. Um, in Milan, they could have done it. It's an autocratic system, and they would simply pour resources and people at it. In Republican Florence, with all the changes of regime, there was no way. He, sa he says, well, the, so the, the wool guild can finance it and take money from tolls and agricultural use. But um, anyway, it wasn't to come about, but it wasn't daft. It, it wasn't... It was visionary in the best way, but not uh, improbable. Um, and his work on the Arno Canal com convinced him, as I said in the first lecture, that uh, the earth must have gone immense changes, that where the rivers cut through mountain ranges and mountainous places, you could see strata of what we call fossils. Um, he decided there must be multiple inundations, and from evidence that the creatures were living there, these um, shelled creatures, um, evidence that they were living, he said that the waters must have been there over sustained period. The biblical days simply wouldn't do that. You couldn't deliver that, uh, that kind of geological evidence. And he decided that the Arno Valley was originally two great lakes at different levels. And I'll read it out. Um, uh, Golfolina in ancient times were joined with Montalbano in the form of a very high bank. This dammed up the, that river in such a way that, before emptying itself into the sea, which was afterward at the foot of the rock, it composed two large lakes, the first of which is where 
Uh, now the city of Florence is seen flourishing together with Prato and Pistoia, and Montalbano continued the remaining part of the bank until where Sara Valley is now located. In the upper part of the Valdano, that's on the, on the right as you're looking at those maps, on the upper part of the Valdano above here, as far as Arezzo, a second lake was generated, which emptied its waters into the above-mentioned lake, enclosed about where we now see Girone. It occupied all the mentioned upper valley for a space of 40 miles in length. What a fantastic vision. Uh, totally original. Nobody else was looking at landscape like this. Ptolemy, Strabo, even the great classical astronomers didn't get this. Um, so it, it is, it is the, the most extraordinary vision. And if you then set that uh, beside the Mona Lisa, you've got your two lakes. I'm not saying this is a literal, um, a literal depiction of the prehistoric state of the Arno Valley, as the mountains are very different but it is absolutely based upon this notion that landscape is unstable, changing, uh, varies um, heavily with the uh, passage of time. So the body of the woman changes, the, 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 body of the, uh, the, the body of the earth changes. And this picture is very much about that notion of the, of the, of the microcosm. I'll, I'll move quickly past these since we've seen them already. Um, but just to read out the microcosm statement from the Codex Lester, one of his statements of the microcosm, we may say the earth has a vegetative soul and that its flesh is the, is the soil. The bones are the arrangement of the, connect, of the connections of the rocks which mountain, of which mountains are composed. Its cartilage is the tufa. Its blood the, is the veins of the waters. The lake of the blood, which is throughout the heart, is the oceanic sea. Its breathing and the increase and decrease of the blood through the pulses in the earth is thus. It is the ebb, the flow and ebb of the sea, and the heart of the soul of the world is in the fire which is infused throughout the earth. The seat of the vegetative soul are the fires which breathe in various parts of the earth through baths and mines of sulphur. And in Volcano, the volcanic island, and Mount Etna in Sicily, and many other places. Um, that is a statement of one of the thematic aspects of Mona Lisa, the body of the woman, the body of the earth, and this living sense. He refers to water in the, in the body of the earth as vene d'aqua, as veins or vessels of water. It's a very animate view of the earth and a very, very dynamic view. Uh, and to, to end in this rather rapid one... Um, Let's think about the content. These are, this is a picture of an ideal beloved lady. It's heavily, heavily framed in terms of Renaissance poetry. Leonardo was antagonistic to poetry in his Paragoni, in his court disputes, but he was antagonistic because he took it so seriously. He had a terrific library of poetry. He had Petrarch. He must, he must have had Dante's um, uh, Divine Comedy. He, he was written about by poets, and he's deeply immersed in the poetic culture. And the typical poem, the absolute gold standard of poem in the Renaissance, is in, in praise of the beloved lady. She's always out of reach. She's as much divine as human. They're based upon real women, but they're abstracted to some point where they become inaccessible. You get this in Renaissance music. Dowland does a lot of this. Um, we've already heard some Dowland. So you've got this image of the woman who is uh, put on some kind of conceptual pedestal which removes her from our own ragged desires. And the poet is continually lamenting the fact that his beloved is inaccessible, unresponsive in some way. And uh, in terms of the, the description of the lady, is very, that is very much the case. And let me just give you a flavour, and you haven't got very much time, but... Uh, of the poetic image of the beloved lady. So it, it's a scientific picture, but it's also poesia. It's intelletto and poe uh, fantasia. It's intelletto and poesia. Um, and this is absolutely crucial. Um, in, and it's a standard trope, but Leonardo takes these standard tropes, and for the first time in painting, he absolutely makes them work. This is Dante from the Convivio from the Banquet, um, in her countenance appear such things as manifest a part of the joy of paradise. I mean in her eyes and in her sweet smile, for here love draws them as to himself. 
They overwhelm our intellect as a ray of sunlight does weak vision. And since I cannot fix my sight on them, I'm content to say but little of them. The failure of sight is a regular thing in Dante. And the Paradiso, ultimately divine light, overwhelms his worth-bound senses. And this, uh, this sense that uh, something is beyond seeing, beyond seeing clearly. Um, the divine is, it can't be seen clearly. And in a way, the beloved lady can't be seen clearly because she is divine. Now, Dante himself provides his own commentary on this passage. And just a little excerpt. The commentary is much longer than the, po the poem. Um, Since in the face, the soul operates principally in these two places, that is, in the eyes and in the mouth. It adorns these most of all and directs its full attention to creating beauty there. It is in these two places that I maintain these delights appear, saying, in her eyes and in her sweet smile. These two places may be called, by way of a charming metaphor, the balconies of the lady who dwells in the edifice of the body, which is to say the soul, because here, though in a veiled manner, she often reveals herself. Balconies, veils, and so on. You can get a sense that Leonardo is absolutely using the metaphorical aspects of the... Uh, of the Dante. In one case, I think he's almost illustrating Dante, but not quite. Um, and this is a passage from the end of the, uh, the end of Purgatorio and the transition into paradise. And this transition is made by a woman called Matilda before Dan Dante's divine Beatrice um, takes over. And this is the description of Matilda, this beautiful drawing at Windsor, late drawing. As a woman dancing turns herself with her feet close to the ground and to each other, and hardly advances one toe out of line, she turned in my direction, looking over the red and yellow flowers, exactly as a virgin will modestly lower her eyes. As soon as she was where the grass was bathed already by the waves of the lovely stream, she graciously raised her eyes to meet mine. I do not think that so much light shone under the brow of Venus when she was pierced by her son, who did not often strike carelessly. She smiled straight at me from the other bank. Um, women's portraits don't smile before Leonardo. They don't react to us. It would be rather licentious. They look at us and smile. The Mona, the Mona Lisa looks at us and smile, which is, which is really very distinctly, distinctly naughty. Um, I, was going to, I was going to look at the poem on, on, um, on, uh, uh, on Cecilia Gallerani, but it's quite well known, so I think... How long have I got? You've got three minutes. Okay. Um, I'll read out some more unfamiliar poems from court poets. And Leonardo became the subject of poetry. So he drew poetry uh, in his pictures. He drew out of poetry and put the, uh, the concept of the beloved lady out of reach into his female portraits, the portraits of women. But he then was the subject of poetry. And in the book, we've collected together a bigger selection than ever before of poems on Leonardo's pictures. Um, so there's a kind of nice circle here of Leonardo doing a poetic picture, which then becomes the subject of poetry. This one is by Niccolo da Carreggio, who is a courtly man. He is at, in Milan and Mantua, um, a courtier rather than a, a paid literary scribbler. Um, and this one goes, If Zeuxis, Lysippus, Pigoteles, and Apelles... Um, three well-known names of ancient artists. Pigoteles was an artist of cameos, much valued at the time. If they had to paint this lady on paper, having to gaze at each of her features and at the grace with which they are then infused, like, one, like when one looks at the sun or counts the stars, his eyes would fail him, because nature does not grant to the eye the powers in, in what nature herself excels. The eye again is failing as... So, my dear Leonardo, if you want to be true to your name and conquer, vince, the humanists rather like puns, if you want to be true to your name and conquer and surpass everyone, cover her face and begin with her hair, whereas if you happen to see her beauties all at once, you will be the portrait, not her, since they are not for the mortal eye. Do trust me. The idea the painter paints himself is something much discussed in Leonardo's time, and Leonardo himself goes to great pains to tell the artist not to paint themselves. Oni dipentori dipinge se is the tag. Every painter paints himself. Um, so this is a strategy recommended by Niccolò Tocreggio to make, make sure that the Mona Lisa is 
as it were, not a self-portrait, which some of you will know has been suggested. And the last one is a Palmer poet who probably never met Leonardo and he met Leonardo at the end of his career and he invents a Leonardo portrait, which is another step beyond not just writing about an actual portrait. It's an Ir Irpino from Palmer who spent much of his career in Naples, so he wasn't really accessible to Leonardo. And this is very nice, and I'll, I'll finish with this. Is this that human and, and true form that is venerated amongst mortal men in our times? Is this broad forehead that resembles the source of a bright growing, glowing light? This is the living lady, an example and model for those who want to paint heavenly features. This is her beautiful mouth, where love forms such sweet and gracious words. These are her eyes glittering with lofty zeal. This is her beautiful neck and bosom, where heaven depicted its own immeasurable beauty. That excellent and famous painter, who painted so much beauty beneath the modest veil, surpassed the limitations of art and triumphed over himself, triumphed over his Vince, this recurrent pun on Vinci as conquering or, or overcoming. So in summary, I would say the Mona Lisa, having begun as a commissioned portrait of a relatively standard kind by people who are like us in a way with all our flaws and uh, all our passing virtues, that um, having begun like that through both science and poetry, and they're absolutely complementary because the poetic figure is veiled, is elusive, is uncertain, is difficult to see, uh, Mona Lisa's smile is elusive at the end of the day but it's also optical so he's managing this amazing thing which Dante accomplished but very few have of having something which is science and spiritual at the same time a perfect balance between uh, the poetry of the spiritual world and the science of the material world um, yeah. anyway if you want to follow that up the, the book is there to buy at some relatively modest price so thank you very much <laughs>